Good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Zimmerman, and on behalf of the Society for Community Research in Action, I would like to welcome you to the online learning uh, series, and this is our second webinar with Dr. Lenny Jason and Dr. Ken Matten, who will be sharing with us, uh, based on their expertise, with creating social change through social policy. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Lenny and I today. This is Ken Matten, and our presentation will highlight the role of social policy in bringing about social change. In particular, we'll address three questions. What are the principles of social change? What are the key elements of the social policy process? And what methods and skills do community psychologists employ to influence policy? As we address these questions, Lenny and I will highlight multiple examples of policy work conducted by community psychologists. Lenny, please start us off with a discussion of the principles and types of social change. Sure, Ken. These five principles on this slide have frequently been used in social activism and policy approaches, and they involve focusing on structural second-order change, confronting power abuses, mobilizing coalitions to correct the power abuses, having a long-term time perspective, and fine-tuning interventions by using feedback from your efforts. These principles were featured in my recent book titled Principles of Social Change. During this presentation, we'll have a chance to go over each of these principles. The first principle is that we need to move away from first-order change. First-order change approaches just focus on the person and are like band-aids. They're cosmetic short-term fixes that rarely address the root of the problem. First-order strategies are alluring because they promise to solve the most deeply rooted problems with person-centered, simple solutions. But these types of interventions can render people powerless to overcome their oppression. In contrast, second-order change influences individuals and their social networks as well as all the other components of their environments that may contribute to the particular problem. As both Ken and I will show, structural second-order change can be achieved by mobilizing coalitions to correct power abuses. And this work often involves a long-term time perspective to build relationships with key gatekeepers. But how do we bring about second-order change? Our journey into this arena of social change often begins with the recognition that something's fundamentally wrong and unfair. This recognition may take the form of a flash of outrage, but the feeling's clear. This needs to change. Often we don't even know why we feel this way, but our intuition can steer us in the right direction. By listening and watching closely, ever-present signs and guides will provide us clues and direction, and the keys to be open and receptive to them. In the settings where we're employed, we can encounter, encounter abuses of power and the need for second-order structural change. So our work settings can and should provide us with important insights and clues about the world of bringing about social change in the policy arena. Here's an example. When I arrived at DePaul University in 1975, it was striking that our clinical community doctoral program had no minority graduate students or faculty members, even though we had a clinic that delivered services to a primarily African-American area in Cabrini-Green. Intuitively, I knew this needed to change, but I had no idea of how to change the norms or policies. And I knew I needed to learn more about my setting, as well as the historical reasons why this unequitable situation existed. Being within the system and learning the norms took time, but this learning process was critical for being able to make strategic changes. Over time, over time I was able to gain credibility in the system and build relationships with my peers so that by the early 1980s, I was elected director of the clinical training program. 
Now in a role that had more influence on graduate admissions, I need more leverage in the system to bring about second order change regarding the ethnic mix of our students and faculty. In other words, over time, we can become better able to understand the hidden meaning behind setting norms as we build relationships in these social settings. We can reconstitute our roles and power to influence a more equitable distribution of resources and opportunities. True second order change involves altering shared goals, roles, and power relationships. In this webinar, we'll provide many examples of how fundamental social policy change can occur. Ken, can you give us now an overview of the social policy process? Sure, Lenny. The material I'm presenting today is based on interviews with 40 community psychologists actually involved, actively involved in social policy and as part of a forthcoming book. Simply put, social policy refers to governmental laws, regulations, and services to enhance the well-being of citizens. As the next few slides show, social policy is influenced by a range of policy actors. It occurs through a series of policy phases, and it is constrained by a large set of contextual factors and forces. Many groups exert influence on policy, directly and indirectly. These policy actors include officials in the executive branch, legislators, judges, advocacy groups, the media, university researchers, citizens, and community-based organizations. Among the community psychologists interviewed from my book project, two-thirds were university faculty, and the other third worked full-time either as policy insiders, working within the legislative and executive branches of government, or in policy-focused organizations. Policy occurs through a set of interrelated phases, indicated in the rectangles in the middle of the slide. Many factors influence policy as it moves through these phases, depicted in the blue rectangles. For example, what gets on for example, what gets on the policy agenda is determined in part by pressing social problems, available policy solutions, politics, and current events. Formulation and adoption of legislation are influenced in part by values, evidence, ideology, and the interests of powerful groups and constituents. Policy implementation is determined in part by capacity, expertise, relationships, and influence networks. Finally, the evaluation and revision of policy are affected by all of the above factors and every once in a while by compelling evaluation research findings. A number of macro social forces and local contextual factors influence and constrain all phases of the policy process. These social forces and contextual factors must be aligned in order for fundamental social change to occur. The policy system is complex, multi-level, and dynamic. Community psychologists interested in having an impact on policy must understand the specific actors, processes, and contextual influences in their area of policy focus. Although work in the policy arena can be very rewarding, there are many obstacles and challenges faced along the way, as Lenny will next discuss. Thanks, Ken. Our second principle of social change involves identifying the power holders. Creating second-order change can seem overwhelming, especially when powerful people or organizations control whether or not your change will be enacted. Power can be seen as a negative and corrupting force or as a useful resource used to accomplish social justice objectives. 
Power is often used to control resources, for example, who is hired or provided funding. Power can also be used to restrict channels for participation in community decisions, such as dictating meeting agendas. In addition, power can be used to shape the definition of a public issue by using censorship or discrediting a group's views or beliefs. Most incarnations of social inequality are caused or exacerbated by an underlying abuse of power. Redistributing power is often a crucial component in a successful large-scale second-order social change movement. Often the causes of abuse and the underlying power structure may be difficult to see clearly. Our gut instincts may be the most powerful tool to uncover the veiled power abuses that need to be challenged. We must use the same passion and intuition that helps one see the paths towards effective second order change to identify and analyze the distribution of power. Let me give an example. Ken, as you know, I've been involved for over 20 years in doing work with patients who've been referred to as having chronic fatigue syndrome. This was the name the Centers for Disease Control gave to patients in the late 1980s. Even though the syndrome had prior been referred to as myalgic encephalomyelitis, patients hated the CFS term and they felt the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, had trivialized their illness as fatigue was part of many illnesses and it was not the primary problem faced by patients. They wanted a medical name that was less stigmatizing. This was a clear example of the power of use as federal officials gave their illness a name they didn't want. In the late 1990s, patients contacted me and asked if I'd provide them evidence that the CFS name could have detrimental effects in controlled studies. In other words, they wanted evidence to support their opinions of the negative effects of the term chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS. Our group subsequently, with patient support and input, conducted research that involved giving medical interns one case study of a patient having all the symptoms of CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome. But the interns were randomly assigned to groups. Each group was told the patient had a different diagnosis. So some were told the patient had CFS, and some were told the patient had been diagnosed with a more medical name, like myalgic encephalopathy. The labels did change attributions, and those interns told the patient had myalgic encephalopathy attributed this illness as more disabling than those told the patient had CFS. After this study was disseminated widely, I was appointed to a federal panel that involved an effort to change this illness and its name. But also appointed to the panel was the CEO of the largest patient organization. At the time, I could not understand why this very influential person seemed so resistant to changing the CFS name. We later found out that her organization was getting millions of dollars from the CDC to brand the term CFS in media campaigns. So neither her nor her organization was really interested in a name change. When this information was disclosed, the leader of this patient organization received considerable anger by patient activists. That change in effort failed, but the patient community continued this battle over the past decade with patient groups around the world demanding a name change. Many patient girl groups worldwide have renamed their organization to include terms such as myalgic encephalomyelitis. The Institute of Medicine in the U.S. is now, now in the process of preparing a report that will be released next year, and that report might involve a name change for this illness. So how do we bring about second-order change when there are often powerful institutional forces that prefer maintaining an inequitable distribution of power and resources. For many of these types of abuses of power, it will take focused and collective efforts of mobilized individuals and community groups to influence the cultural and political landscape affecting social change. We can be partners to these collaborative efforts and developing trusting relationships with these coalitions is critical. Ken, can you share with our viewers some of the internal methods for bringing about policy change? There are both internal 
and external pathways to influence policy. Let's look at some of the internal methods first. Later in the presentation, I'll focus on the external ones. Policymakers frequently convene advisory groups composed of experts in an area to help guide policy planning. A number of community psychologists interviewed indicated that their greatest policy success resulted from the work of an advisory board, commission, or committee that they were invited to serve on or chair. For example, Preston Brittner co-directed the Family with Services Needs Advisory Board to the Connecticut General Assembly in 2006. This work led to a statewide program of reform that provided community-based services, including family support centers, rather than criminal sanctions to youth status offenders in Connecticut. Consultation is another means of internal policy influence. Many consultative relationships occur with executive branch officials in need of content experts to provide guidance on issues under their jurisdiction. For example, Beth Shin's long-term consultative role with the New York City Department of Homeless Services has contributed to a number of substantive reforms in New York's approach to the homeless, including the Housing First model, in which homeless individuals are first provided housing without preconditions such as the receipt of social services. Another important route to policy influence is through direct communication with policymakers or their staff via one-on-one -on -one meetings, hearings, and related means. Cliff O'Donnell's presentation to a committee of the Hawaii State Legislature and follow-up activities contributed to passage of state legislation that prohibited sale of semi-automatic assault pistols. This policy constitutes one of the most restrictive laws on possession and use of firearms in the United States. The judicial arena has been critical to bringing about social change. One judicial influence method is submitting amicus briefs to state and federal courts. Such briefs are submitted by groups who are not parties in the case and are intended to inform the court about their knowledge related to the issue at hand. Clinton Anderson, director of the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Concerns Office at APA, coordinated the submission of many amicus briefs over the years that advanced LGBT rights, including the recent cases on gay marriage. Expert testimony and expert reports represent additional methods to influence court decisions. These can be part of class action suits to bring about social change. For example, Jack Teebs was asked by the American Civil Liberties Union to conduct an empirical study as part of a class action suit to determine whether the state of Illinois was denying the civil rights of mentally ill residents in intermediate care nursing homes. The plaintiffs won the case resulting in court-ordered reform. This included community-based placement of many of those formally retained in the restrictive institutions. Thanks, Ken. And let me give an example within the judicial area. As we know, community organizations and coalitions can revolutionize how we treat our most vulnerable citizens. One example is the Oxford House Movement rented recovery homes that are completely democratically run without staff. Millions need affordable housing. Millions of homes are available. Oxford Houses represents one creative approach to deal with both of these issues synergistically. There are no professional staff at these self-governing settings, which are always rented houses. Six to 10 people stay in an Oxford house where they can stay as long as they can pay their rent, and abstain from drugs and alcohol. 
this organization has grown from one house to over 1,700 Oxford houses now operating within 48 states. And over the last year, it served over 25,000 people, making it the largest residential recovery network in the country. In the current cost-conscious recovery environment, this network of self-help Oxford houses represents an inexpensive and potentially effective setting promoting abstinence. Some communities oppose sharing their neighborhood with recovery group homes like Oxford House, even though residents do not use any alcohol or drugs. For example, some towns have passed laws that make it illegal for more than five unrelated people to live in a house. This deliberately targets Oxford Houses, which usually need six to 10 house members to make rent affordable for all the house members. Because I had worked for many years on evaluation studies of Oxford House, I was called by a lawyer who asked if we could help him with a dispute involving a town trying to close down the local Oxford House. By passing an ordinance forbidding more than five unrelated individuals from living in one house. We quickly looked into a National Oxford House data set and examined how the number of residents in the Oxford House affected residents' individual outlooks for recovery. We found that a larger house size of eight to 10 residents actually corresponded with less criminal and aggressive behavior. These findings were entered into the court case, and I was later told that these results were critical in the judge ruling in favor of the Oxford House, which kept the Oxford House open, even though it had more than six non-related residents. Since then, I testified with these data in a number of other high-profile court cases, and each one, the findings of our study helped convince the judge to allow the Oxford Houses to remain in the communities. A few years later, an official from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration studied the Oxford House movement with an effort to expand the number of houses by thousands. In their report, they concluded that the organization of this self-help organization was somewhat disorganized and chaotic, and as a consequence, would not be able to oversee this expansion. The person who wrote up the report had studied my 20 years of work with the organization and concluded that I was in the best position to oversee the expansion of this network. They wanted to provide me considerable funding to take over this expansion, and of course, I refused. Since they did not understand the organic Oxford House movement was democratically run, and for that reason, it might not be as efficient as what Washington expected, but it was nevertheless self-run and it should not be co-opted by Washington. In our work with community organizations who are mobilizing to change the status quo, we need to be sure that federal agencies do not undermine their efforts. As Ken and I have been suggesting through this webinar, second order change often takes time. Progress can be gradual and uneven, and there'll be setbacks along the way. The fourth principle of social change indicates that patience and a long-term commitment are critical aspects of social change movements. And this allows us to build long-term relationships with our community collaborators. And I've been discussing one successful example of second order change, the obstacle faced, and lessons learned. Can you continue your discussion at this point of methods of policy influence with specific focus on external methods? Lenny, external advocacy influences policy through bringing constituent or political pressure to bear on elected officials. It is often spearheaded by advocacy organizations and may involve raising public awareness about an issue, mobilizing resources, garnering experts to support the campaign, coalition building, use of media, and involvement in larger social movements. Community psychologists often work closely with advocacy organizations in such work. For example, Paul Spear generated evidence to help make the case that there was a link between vacant housing and crime in Camden, New Jersey. The collaboration proved to be very effective, spawning sustained political pressure. 
in part due to Spears' graphic depiction using geographic information systems of the vacant housing crime linkage. In the end, millions of dollars of city and state funding were generated to support housing rehabilitation. The media are an essential resource for mobilizing citizen and stakeholder involvement in external advocacy. Advocacy campaigns make use of the full range of media options noted on the slide. For example, Brian Wilcox effectively used the media to help reverse Nebraska state policy that banned comprehensive HIV prevention sex education in the public schools. This media work was conducted in partnership with Planned Parenthood and involved writing op-eds and meeting with newspaper editorial boards. This effort contributed to a reversal of the state school board of education policy that had limited HIV prevention sex education to abstinence only approaches. A range of policy relevant documents are developed regularly to influence policymakers. These are used both in external and internal policy influence work. They can be disseminated to advocacy groups who use the ideas and information to conduct external advocacy campaigns, or they can be taken by the authors directly to policymakers and their staff, the internal pathway. Lonnie Snowden was asked to write and direct the supplement on culture, race, and ethnicity accompanying the 2001 Surgeon General's report on mental health. This report helped contribute to a renewed interest on mental health disparities at the time, culminating recently in the portions of the 2010 Affordable Care Act that focused on health disparity reduction. Lenny, in interviewing Lonnie Snowden and the other community psychologists involved in the policy arena, I have been repeatedly struck by the personal qualities they bring to bear to their policy work. Please share a bit more about this personal dimension. Sure, Ken. In this policy work, both patience and persistence are essential in opposing powerful vested interests intent on maintaining the status quo or in amassing coalitions to confront institutional abuses of power. As you know, I've been committed to working with recovery homes and chronic illness because I was passionate about these areas of work. Social change can begin by helping people identify issues for which they have strong feelings. It's more likely to occur when we have a personal and passionate interest in the issue. In a sense, having a fire in your belly where you live and breathe about something you really care about, that's the starting point. If the focus of one's work is to fulfill a course objective or a credential for a professional degree, it's less likely to have a commitment to stay the course for long time periods that are necessary. Small wins can also help sustain and mobilize citizen groups to continue to pursue even larger objectives. Solowinski knew that starting with smaller problems and actions and succeeding with these first steps toward tackling larger, more intimidating social problems. Belinsky has addressed one of the most difficult questions in social change. How can activists stay committed to a cause? In the meaningful pursuit of social justice, the importance of small wins cannot be overemphasized. Lenny, one question I am exploring in my policy interviews is whether there is a set of core policy skills that community psychologists apply across the varied policy contexts, methods, and vantage points. The interview findings suggest there are. One core skill is relationship building. Relationships are crucial for policy influence. Decision makers are especially likely to take into account policy ideas and research evidence when they come from a trusted source. 
The development of trusting working relationships often involves a considerable investment of time, including face-to-face -face meetings and networking. It also involves mutuality, a willingness to provide information or other resources of value to the policymaker, and to keep sensitive information in confidence. Relationship development skills are central to the full gamut of policy influence methods and activities we have discussed and take place on the policymaker's turf. Sound advice concerning relationship building is provided in this interview excerpt from a director of a university policy center. The mutual interests of psychologists and policymakers will be advanced the second we can figure out ways to develop relationships at the outset. Take almost any other work community psychologists do. We do good work by developing relationships and partnerships. We have to have partnerships in policy. A second core policy skill is communication. Communication skills, both oral and written, are essential to policy influence. Since policymakers consider a large array of issues in a limited amount of time, the ability to communicate clearly and succinctly is critical. Skill in policy framing and translation are especially important. Policy framing involves tailoring policy ideas and research findings to maximize leverage within the current policy debate, ideally providing a compelling, practical, and politically acceptable contribution to the policy issue. Translation refers to the ability to communicate complicated research findings in a digestible and useful form to non-researchers. Several aspects of communication and relationship building are illustrated in this interview excerpt from a Policy Insider. Communication is hugely important, particularly the ability to communicate in the language of policy quickly, efficiently. You should have the ability to talk to a very broad range of people, know how to be nice to people who may not seem very important at the time, and be able to communicate through the media. Ken, that was a great quote. The effects of social action are often not immediate or easily identifiable. While the dynamic nature of social activism campaigns may make evaluation challenging, measuring progress is vital and lies at the heart of each community strategy. Actively involving our community partners in these activities provides them the skills to continue this self-reflection and analysis process into the future. Let me give another example of how our research and data can be used to influence policy. As you know, the tobacco industry has a lot of money. In this case, money means a lot of power to influence any laws that could affect their sales. For decades, over 3,000 youth begin smoking each day, and tobacco use is the leading cause of death in the U.S. I was committed to finding ways to reduce youth smoking, so I worked on school-based prevention programs in the late 1970s and 1980s. When implementing smoking cessation programs in Chicago, the students we worked with told us they could easily purchase tobacco in stores throughout their communities. In 1988, based on this student input, our group decided to assess illegal commercial sales of tobacco. When we sent youth into stores to purchase cigarettes, we found about 80% of the merchants sold cigarettes to the miners. After the local Chicago media widely published our study's findings, Officer Talbot from the suburban town of Woodridge, Illinois, contacted me saying that his town of Woodridge, Illinois had solved this problem by sending merchants a letter saying that it was illegal to sell miners tobacco. I said to Officer Talbot, this might not deter the merchants from selling miners tobacco, as a police officer would have to be in the store when the merchant sold cigarettes 
And if a police officer was in the store, the merchant probably would sell the minor tobacco. I was then invited by Officer Talbot and the police department to work with them on this issue. I showed Officer Talbot and his police department how to collect data by having underage youth go into stores and try to purchase cigarettes. With this method, the Woodridge Police Department found the majority of stores in Woodridge sold minors tobacco. All the data in this figure were generated and collected by the police department, and after we found that the majority of stores sold to minors during our first three assessments, we then worked collaboratively on a new law that provided fines to the merchants if they sold minors tobacco and parking by tickets for youth who were publicly smoking. Two years after implementing the two-pronged program, rates of merchant sales to minors decreased from an average of 70% to less than 5%, and adolescent smoking decreased over 50% in a Woodridge Junior High School. The data were collected by the police department. This town has continued to collect these data for the past two decades. Woodridge was the first U.S. city to demonstrate that cigarette smoking could be effectively decreased through legislation and enforcement. Officer Talbot became a national figure in this area, and he influenced the passage of the Sinar Amendment, which now requires all states to implement similar strategies to reduce minors' access to tobacco. Just before Lenny illustrated the fifth principle of social change with that exciting example of policy influence, I had highlighted relationship building and communication as two core policy skills. Now I'd like to suggest two additional ones. Research skills represent an important asset community psychologists bring to the policy arena. The generation of policy relevant high-quality research findings contributes to the status as research expert and enhances the possibility of cultivating productive relationships with policymakers. The types of research that contributed to interviewees' greatest policy successes included program evaluation, research that enhanced policy-relevant phenomena, that enhanced understanding of policy-relevant phenomena, and research on community-based delivery systems. Interdisciplinary collaboration in such research is of paramount importance to match the ecological complexity of the social issues addressed. Two brief interview excerpts from policy researchers touch on a few important aspects of research skills in the policy arena. Having multiple methods is really critical to look from multiple points of view and so that one can have the appropriate research for the appropriate occasion. Training in both qualitative and quantitative, doing some of the work requires creative methodological solutions. A fourth core policy skill can be termed strategic analysis, encompassing both policy analysis and strategy development. Policy analysis includes generating novel policy approaches, delineating the benefits and limitations of competing approaches, and evaluating the impact of current policy. Strategy development includes both mapping out an overarching plan to influence policy and the very specific tactics employed along the way. Strategy development might include, for example, generating a plan for a multi-year advocacy campaign on the one hand or devising means to gain access to a single powerful decision maker on the other. Given its multifaceted nature, strategic analysis is best conducted as a team effort involving collaboration with individuals and groups that possess complementary skills, 
knowledge and perspectives. One important aspect of strategic analysis is reflected in this quote from a university faculty member. There are two routes. The elite influence route is really important. Make it a point to get to know someone in a powerful position. Let them know about an issue and help them understand how they can operate on it. Then there's the social mobilization strategy. You can do it through the media or the way that Saul Alinsky did it. Concerning the first route, in my own work, I have worked closely with the president of my university, Freeman Rabowski, over several decades, providing ideas and evaluation data to support his pioneering, strengths-based approach to generate outstanding academic success among minority students at my university. In part due to our collaborative work, UMBC's Meyerhoff program has become a national model. In turn, Dr. Rabowski has played multiple consultative roles in the national government. For example, since 2012, he has served as chair of President Obama's Advisory Commission to Educational Excellence for African Americans. Ken, here are some of the topics on social change we've talked about. When identifying power holders, we need to recognize how they first arrived at that position and why they contributed to maintain control. Without this knowledge, tactics to thwart their efforts could be fruitless or only for order change may occur. Similarly, community leaders and coalitions can form strategies to produce real enduring change just as Gandhi did in freeing India from British rule. Activists also need to stay committed to an issue over time and evaluate their actions. This all occurs within relationships with multiple individuals and groups who become the allies for long-term change. Social policy change leaders will often rely on conjuring up a dream and sustaining it with intuition in order to overcome the obstacles that we face in our community work. These principles are like an orchestra. All the principles can be working at the same time in our efforts to bring about social change. And they all help us develop solid collaborations with the different parties working on change. Each principle of social change represents part of the social change journey, but they're subtly interrelated. When used tactfully in concert, they can create an unstoppable force in any movement. Back to you, Ken. And Lenny, here are some key themes from our discussion of community psychologists' involvement in social policy. First, community psychologists have made important policy contributions in the, pol in the public interest, contributing to social change in a wide variety of content areas. Second, these policy influences span all branches and levels of government and have been initiated from multiple vantage points, including universities, intermediary policy organizations, and from within government as a policy insider. Third, the methods employed to influence policy were many and varied, with method choice depending in part on whether an internal or external pathway of influence was pursued. Fourth, a number of core policy influence skills can be identified, including relationship building, communication, research, and strategic analysis. And finally, determination, passion, and resilience in the face of multiple barriers and challenges were described as essential to policy work, as well as the importance of being proactive, seizing opportunities to make a difference when and where they arise. Let's conclude our presentation with parting words from two community psychologists involved in the policy arena. First, 
inspiring comments about policy work from the director of an intermediary policy organization. I love this work. I feel like I'm making a difference. After trying a lot of different careers in academia, foundations, and clinical, the ability to work in the policy environment and bring good science to influence it, shape it, and understand how to do that is just wonderful. I encourage anybody who's oriented that way to figure out how to make it happen. Second, parting words from a university faculty member that underscore the importance of policy engagement as a means to pursue second order change. In terms of future generations, the message is that it is important to be engaged in public policy. We really can't take our discipline far if we're not. Every day I'm more convinced that if we want to have second order change, it has to be at the broader level. Individual change is important, but it won't get us as far as we need to go. Lenny and I thank all of you for listening to our presentation. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, we'll be presenting in a workshop at the Scross Summer Institute to be held at UMass Lowell next June before the biennial conference. And now, Lindsay, back to you. Thank you so much, Ken and Lenny. You've shared a lot of valuable principles and strategies for creating social change through social policy for our listeners. And on behalf of the Society for Community Research and Action, I want to thank you both for participating in the SCRA webinar series and hope this has been useful to all of those listening. And with that, we'll sign off.